Greetings. Uh, just so you know, this is um, this will be my 801 Bible studies on my YouTube channel. Uh, the the early ones were mostly just slideshows. They were short of duration. So, and then I broke down and bought a microphone. So, yeah, I probably actually have about three or four hundred actual audio Bible studies, but. This Bible study is going to be on, it's a continuation of Zionism, Dispensational Theology, and the Pre-Trib Rapture. In the first study, we did Zionism, so this is going to be more on Dispensations. So let's take a look at Dispensations as it is taught in Baptist Bible College, of which I was an, an attendee and studied dispensational theology. So I know what they teach. You know, I'm not telling you this to be, tell you how smart I am. No, I'm just telling you this to so that you know that I know what I'm talking about when we're talking about Baptist theology. So let's take a look at it. Now, if you um, want to know who killed Jesus, and I know the Baptist churches teach, well, it was the Romans. Well, that's fine, but how about we read what the Bible says? I believe the King James Bible, you know, the one that they claim to believe. So turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're going to start reading in verse 14. We're going to read verse 15, and then we're going to read verse 16. First Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 14. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they please not God and are contrary to all men forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins alway for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Hmm even as they have of the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins all the way, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. That's Paul. Okay? So, let's take a look one more thing. Did you ever wonder why the New Testament was written in Greek? Why Paul went to Greece, he went to Thessalonica, he went to Colossae. Uh, you know, these were uh, Ephesus. These were all Greek cities in Greece. And the New Testament was written in Greek. Why is that? Well, Jesus speaking in Matthew 21, 43, Jesus said, Therefore say I unto you, who's Jesus speaking to here? He's speaking to the Jews. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Maybe that is why the New Testament was written in Greek to Greeks and Jews, you know, but... Uh, because Greek was the common language back in those days. Believe it or not, English is the number one most popular second language in the world. Second language. I mean, uh, Denmark teaches English, Iceland teaches English, Germany teaches English to their all their high school students, uh, China, Japan, um, Hey, you can go to a country like uh, Thailand, and if you uh, have a degree, college degree, you can go over there and be an English teacher. I mean, English is 
the number one second language in the world. There's always a demand for native English speakers. Well, that's what Greek was. Greek was the uh, language of commerce in the days of Jesus. Hebrew was the language for the scholars, well, Aramaic. And then Latin was the language of the government, since uh, Greece used to be in control of the that area, but then Rome rose up and conquered Greece. But Greek was had been the uh, official language for hundreds of years. So, uh, you know, I, I, I will guarantee you Jesus knew Greek. Now, not in the synagogue, he didn't speak it, but, you know, if, if you were, Joseph was a carpenter, and if you wanted to sell to the common people, I'll guarantee you uh, the Roman soldiers and the, the Greeks, they didn't come to Joseph and speak Hebrew. Maybe Hebrew was spoken by Jesus and his family at home, but uh, the language of commerce was Greeks, Greek. So, all right, so let's take a look at dispensations. What is a dispensation? All right, according to Webster's 1828 Dictionary, which I really, really recommend to people, I mean, uh, Webster was a Bible scholar and spoke numerous languages, including Hebrew of the Old Testament language, Greek, which was the New Testament language. He knew Latin, Spanish, French, German, English. Of course, he wrote the dictionary. Webster wrote our dictionary. He standardized the spelling. Guy was a... And he was a Bible scholar. Guy knew his stuff, let me tell you what. All right, dispensation. Um, it means to distri distribution, the act of dealing out to different persons or places as the distribution of water indifferently to all parts of the earth. That's the number one. Number two, the dealing of God to his creatures, the distribution of good and evil, natural or moral, and the divine government. Uh, let's see, neither are God's methods or intentions different in his dispensations to each private man. Uh, number three, the granting of a license or the license itself to do that which is forbidden by laws or canons or to omit something which is commanded. That is the dispensing with of a law or canon or the exemption of a particular person from the obligation to comply with its injunctions. For example, the Pope has power to dispense with the canons of the church but he has no right to grant dispensations to the injury of a third person. And, and this is, he's pointing out their uh, interpretation, okay? The, Noah Webster was not a pope, a papist, a Vatican follower or Catholic, no. Uh, number four, this is the most important one. That which is dispensed or to bestow, bestowed a system of principles and rights enjoined as the mosaic, mosaic, as in Moses, as in as the mosaic dispensation, the gospel dispensation, including the former, the Levitical law and rights, the latter, the scheme of redemption by Christ. It's a Latin word, and it says, see the word dispense. Well, what does dispense mean? It means to deal or divide out in parts or portions, to distribute. That's what dispense means. It means to give something. Okay? I mean, what is a dispenser? That's what dispensation, you know, dispense. Uh, what's a dispenser? A soap dispenser? You go to the restaurant, you go to the restroom, and you wash your hands, and there's a soap dispenser there. It means it gives out something. Well, that's what dispensation means. It doesn't mean a period of time like the Baptists want you to believe. That's totally wrong. All right, the word dispensation appears four times in the Bible. Uh, one time, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15, starting in verse 15. But I have used none of these things, 
neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For if it were better for me to die, than that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me, if I preach not the gospel. For I do, for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward, but if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward when, then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. What's, what, what is Paul giving, dis, dispensing, the dispensation? Grace, the gospel, Christ. So, there's, there's two dispensations in the Bible. It's called the Old Testament. When God gave Moses the law, he dispensed the law. He gave the law to Moses. And then the dispensation of Christ, which is the gospel, which is the good news. Grace. Okay, let's see. And then in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8, starting in verse 8, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made himself known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath pur purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Hmm, okay. So, you know, it has nothing to do with a period of time like the Baptists seem to teach. How about Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, 2, and 3? For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. And Colossians chapter 1 and let's see. Let me see where to start. How about verse 23? Colossians 1. And Colossians was a city in Greece too. Okay, Colossians chapter 1, verse 23. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been laid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints." Now, if dispensation means a time period, whereof I am made a minister according to the time period of God, which is given to me for you? How can you give somebody a time period? No. To fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. No, just to dispense... Dispensation means to give something, you know? Now, dispensational Baptists will teach that people were saved in the Old Testament by the keeping of the law. Okay? They teach this. Not me. Uh-uh. No. Now, the Bible says that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall everything be established. 
So let's take a look at the book of Romans, chapter 4, and verse 3. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God. Do you know what it is when you believe something? It means you have faith. Belief and faith are basically, they're synonyms, they're synonymous. They mean the same thing. If you have faith, you believe. And if you believe, you have faith. If, if, if somebody comes to you and asks you to borrow money, if you believe they're going to pay you back, and you have the money and you want to loan it to them, you will. If you have faith that they will pay you back, and you have the means to give it to them, and you, you know you can spare it, and you know, belief and faith means the same thing, right? For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness, not keeping of the law. They're lying. They have to be lying. Are you going to tell me somebody that has a, a, a doctorate's PhD degree in the Bible hasn't read this? All right, well, they might miss Romans chapter 4, 13, but how about Galatians 3, 6? Even as Abraham believed God, even as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Does it say, even as Abraham kept the law and was saved? No. It said he believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. All right. Those are Paul. Let's read the book of James. James is a second witness. James chapter 2, verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Does it say anywhere that God, Abraham kept the law? No. Guess what, people? You were saved in the Old Testament the same way you're saved in the New Testament. Belief. But it's not just believing. It's, you know, what you believe will reflect your actions. Let's face it. That's just the way it is. You know, Abraham was told by God to go into a, a, a country that he knew not. And he went. He didn't question God and say, well, you know, God, I don't know this place, so, you know, I, I don't know. I don't want to go. No. He packed his bags and he hit the road. He hit the dusty trail. And that's faith. That's believing. You know, he believed God. He says, oh, you're going to give me something. Okay, well, I'm going to leave my father's house and I'm going to go to a place that I know not. That's, that's what it is. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 4, verse 9, and then we're going to read verse 13. Cometh this blessing then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Verse 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. That's, you know, Abraham's the Old, Old Testament people. You know? So, dispensational theology preaching Baptists preach that in the Old Testament you were saved by the law. Well, Paul and James says that's not true. Do you know that they teach that after the pre-trib rapture, before the, just before the beginning of the tribulation, the great tribulation, uh, they teach that to be saved after the rapture of the church that you have to have faith in Christ and keep the law. So in other words, if the Jews rebuild their temple, you're going to have to have faith in Christ, refuse the mark of the beast, 
and maybe do animal sacrifices. I guess the sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross, it just can't quite get it done. Almost. But you got to do that little bit extra. You know, you better bring a goat or a sheep or, you know. They say that you have to keep the law in the tribulation. You got to have faith in Christ and keep the law. Huh? What? Well, let's read. See, the thing is, is when you read these verses, they will, uh, to them, they'll, well, you know, they'll say, well, that's, that dispensation's for the Jews, or this dispensation's for the church, or that verse is for the Jews, this one's for the church, you know, and it just doesn't apply. Well, how about reading Galatians chapter 1, 1, starting. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. You know what accursed means? You could pronounce it accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed or accursed. So what does that do to the Mormons? You know, that uh, had the angel Moron I, Moron I, Moron I, come down from heaven and give Joseph Smith the golden plates, a different, another gospel? Cursed. Accursed. Do you know that people that preach, you got to keep the law, in the tribulation dispensation. Do you know they're cursed? Cursed of God. They are. They are they're preaching another gospel. Oh, you gotta believe in Jesus and keep the law to be saved in the tribulation period. That's the you know, when they say the church age or the church dispensations are closed, gone when we're all raptured out of here in the pre trib rapture. Do you know they're cursed? Because it's another gospel. I mean it's faith in Christ and him crucified. That's the gospel, not keeping any law. How can you keep the law? You know, there's, there's a, I've heard, I've heard there's over 600 laws. You know anybody that's kept them? Not me. Okay. Now, when you go to a Baptist church, there's the three things that are always taught together. Zionism, which is basically Jew worship, dispensations, and the pre-trib rapture. I mean, you know, it kills me when I read a church's statement of faith and they say, oh, the pre-trib rapture. Did, is believe, and they, they, they say, oh, well, we're fundamentalists. Is the pre-trib rapture a fundamental of the faith? I mean, think about it. Did Jesus say, believe on me in the pre-trib rapture and thou shalt be saved? Does it, does it, you know, can you not believe in the pre-trib rapture and be saved? Why is it in a statement of faith? A statement of faith should be essential doctrines only. Okay? Why is the pre-trib rapture in a statement of faith? Is it an essential doctrine? Absolutely not. But let's read 
a few things. For those of you that don't, you know, think that the, um, well, let's take a look what the Bible says. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 and 6, through verses 4 through 6, the last book of the Bible, there are only two more future resurrections, or raptures, if you prefer to call it that, spoken of after the two witnesses appear. Let's read it. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the dead, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now, the resurrection is the rapture. Okay? So, the Bible says, this is the first resurrection. And it happens after those that were killed, who were beheaded for the witness of Christ, they didn't worship the beast, they didn't take his image, they did worship the image, they didn't take the mark of the beast upon their foreheads or on their hands. It says, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Okay. Now, my note. In the above scriptures, uh, in the in the previously mentioned scriptures, these are the martyrs. Okay, John said, this is the first resurrection. John didn't say that this is the second phase of the first resurrection, as pre-trib rapture people will say. So, if this is the first resurrection, can there be a resurrection before this one? Uh... Let's see, first. If you got two people and one's first and the other one's second or last, no. Can there be a resurrection before this one? No. Unless, of course, you want to add to the Bible, which is forbidden in Revelation chapter 22. So, the first resurrection is of the dead in Christ, and the second resurrection is after a thousand years. After the thousand-year reign of Christ, which is called the millennium. Millennium is just a Latin word. It means thousand. Paul wrote that the dead in Christ must rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, this is a very, very, very important point, people. If there comes a Messiah and we're not caught up in the air to meet him, it's the wrong Messiah. It's not the Christ. It'll be the Antichrist, the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition. Do you get what I'm saying? You have to be caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the air or it's the wrong Messiah. So if, if somebody comes to earth having supernatural powers and we're still here and we're not caught up in the air to meet him in the air, it's the wrong Messiah. Please remember that. May the Holy Spirit bring that to mind when the time, if the time comes. You know, people have been saying Christ is coming back and for 2,000 years almost. They've been saying that. Are we going to be the generation to see it happen? I don't know. I really don't know. So, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, it says, And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Read it in the King James Bible, which I believe, and, you know, Zionistic 
dispensational pre-trib rapture Baptist teach preachers claim to believe the pre you know the King James Bible too. Read it. First Thessalonians chapter four verses sixteen and seventeen. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 and 5, John sees the souls of the saints who were beheaded for refusing the mark of the Antichrist, or the beast, during the Great Tribulation. John writes that they will rise and reign with Christ for 1,000 years and that this is the first resurrection. If according to John, the beheaded rise in the first resurrection, and Paul said that those who are alive and remain are not caught up to be with Christ until after the dead in Christ are resurrected, then this means the catching up or rapture takes place after the tribulation. It has to. There's no other way to it. Now compare the previous mentioned scriptures with 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 23. Now this is, now, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of those who slept. In other words, dead, right? For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after those, afterwards, those who are Christ at his coming. Notice only one resurrection of the dead in Christ is mentioned here. Who, according to Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17, must take place before we who are alive and remain are caught up with them. Why would Jesus say the dead in Christ when did Jesus say the dead in Christ would be resurrected? Hmm. All right, let's take a look. In John chapter 6, verses 39 through 40, Jesus said, This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. Jesus 6 uh, John 6 and verse 44. Jesus said, no, man, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Is the last day the thousand-year reign of Christ? Well, there's a verse in the Bible that says, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. Doesn't it say that? Um, let's take a look. All right, that's in Second uh, Peter verse three and verse eight, and there's a whole bunch of Bible deceivers that'll tell you that Second Peter doesn't wasn't written by Peter and doesn't belong in the Bible because reason being, this verse will confirm Paul as an apostle, and they hate Paul. I mean, Paul gives a lot of warnings about the man of sin, the son of perdition the beast, the antichrist, what by whatever name you call him, gives a lot of warnings. And if you get rid of Paul's writings, well, a lot of the warnings are gone. But in Second Peter, Second Peter verse three and verse eight, chapter three, verse eight, but beloved, be not ignorant. Ignorant means you don't know something. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Okay, so what is the last day? Hmm. All right. Um, so, is the last day of the thousand year reign of Christ? I believe so. Then it is eternity, and time is counted no more. So if Jesus himself said the day in Christ will be raised on the last day, and Paul said we who are alive and remain will not be caught up or raptured until after the dead are raised, then where does the secret pre trib rapture fit in? Huh. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 52 it says, In a moment, 
in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. At the last trump. Okay. Where would the last trump be found? Well, let's see. The last trump. I bet you it's in the last book of the Bible, Revelation. Ah, okay. Yeah, the Revelation, the last book of the Bible mentions trumps, which is trumpets. No, not, not uh, Donald. So in Revelation, the last book of the Bible, there are seven trumps, seven vials, which are the, you know, the plagues. So there's seven trumps, and the seventh trump is the last one. And guess what? It's at the end of the tribulation. So where's the secret rapture pit fit in? It don't. So let me do my conclusion here. My opinion is the evil dispensational pre-trib liars are the ones who want to deceive Christian people by teaching the pre-trib rapture. Some are merely misled led, and others deceive due to just being pure evil. This being so that the loose, lukewarm, churchy people lose their faith when they miss the rapture, the pre-trib rapture. And believers understand that they must die for their faith, totally unprepared. Dispensational liars want you to believe that the Antichrist Jews who hate Jesus are God's chosen people. In John 8, 44, Jesus called them, of their father, the devil. When the truth is that Christians are the true children of Abraham and Israel. Read Galatians 3, 29. So pre-trib dispensational teachers lie and say, will say, oh, well, you know, Jesus is not a wife beater. He's not going to let us go through the tribulation. God would never let us die for our faith or suffer persecution. And then when you show them verses, a clear Bible warnings about persecution of the church, they'll say, oh, well, pfft, that's not for Christians. That's for the Jews. That doesn't apply to us. But, you know, think about it. Ten of the twelve apostles died for their faith. Stephen died for his faith. Paul died for his faith. Millions in history have died for their faith in Jesus. Pre-tribbers are the spoiled brats of Western churchianity. Did you know that 50 plus million Christians died in communist Russia under Joseph Stalin in the last hundred years? What, they were not worthy to escape? Huh? Really? Perhaps Satan can trick these people, the ch lukewarm church people, to take 666, the mark of the beast, since Satan's going to convince them it's not the mark of the beast because it can't be the mark of the beast because you're going to be raptured out of here before it happens. We're not going to be here. That's what they're going to tell you. And if they do have to die for their faith and lose their homes and their jobs and their bank accounts and have to, you know, be left with nothing, how many shall deny their faith thinking Jesus was a false prophet since he lied about the preacher of rapture. You see, people, false prophecies have consequences. M many shall follow the Messiah of the Jews as the Jews proudly proclaim, see, we told you Jesus was a false Messiah and a false prophet. And let me tell you something, people. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. So, you know, people, when you get into the Bible, the Bible commands you to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth thought to be the shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Paul wrote that to Timothy. Study, not just read. I mean, if you're spending all your time watching sports and, you know, or soap operas or whatever the case might be, or Housewives of whatever, Atlanta or whatever garbage, or or Beverly Hills or Hollywood or whatever, or Dancing with the Idols or whatever, you're 
you're going to be in trouble. So, so, well, let's have the bad comments start pouring in. That uh, I guess I'm an anti-Semite for believing Jesus. And after all, the Jews in their writings, look up Yeshu, Y-E-S-H-U, in the Jewish Encyclopedia, and read where Jew Jesus is called the most evil anti-Semite that ever lived. Not Hitler, Jesus. Because he tried to lead the people astray. Don't believe me? Read it yourself. Well, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world, and that's Jesus who is the Christ. In Jesus' precious name, amen.